So now, BL, uh, are you going to work from there? I think I'm going to. Can everybody? Um, I don't think you can. Wait a second. I'm not on yet, am I? Bob, BL is. Uh, now she is. Okay, can you guys hear me now? I don't know. Yeah, okay. So I just don't talk loud enough. Boy, I've never had that problem before. Um, <laughs> yeah. Keep going. Keep talking. I just am not. Whoa. Get close enough. How about this? Okay, is that better? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, 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 yes. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi. I'm here. And I'm going to talk to you today um, just a little tiny bit about astrology. I'm going to talk more on your third father and the chakras. So I hope you agree with me. Um, I think it's going to put it all together for me. Because um, basically what we're talking about, when we talk astrology, when we talk anything, is we're talking about the energy system. And that's what our etheric body is, an energy system. Prana is absolute energy. There is nothing in the manifested universe that does not possess an energy body. They're subtle and intangible, but substantial enough to control and condition our outer physical body. Our etheric body is part of the greater body known as the etheric web. And that's the field of space. And as such, it's a constant stream of these circulating energies and forces. Ether was considered by ancient scholars to be the fifth element. The first four, of course, being fire, air, water, and earth. It was known even then to be the substance that the universe was made of. Those ancient scholars were pretty smart, weren't they? Um, so as such, the substance is uh, where light travels through. The sun, uh, distant stars, they all travel through this ether. Back then, it was seen as being beyond the characteristic of the elements known on Earth, so it personified the skies and heavens. Maybe that's how they arrived at that, but it was true. That inner truth still spoke out. Um, we know that it circulates throughout the universe and conditions the activities and qualities of every form found within that universe, as this quote from Esoteric Astrology tells us. Just as the forces of the planet and of the inner spiritual man pour through the etheric body of the individual man upon the physical plane and condition his outer expression, activities, and qualities. So do the varying forces of the universe pour through every part of the etheric body of that entity that we call space and condition and determine the outer expression, the activities, and qualities of every form found within the cosmic periphery. Isn't that a great thought? Okay, you're gonna see a lot of this, I guess, apparently. <laughs> Eva showed some of it. Um, and that's good because I personally don't think you can ever get enough of it. Uh, it's my favorite chart in all of its uh, additions. Um, so here we've got the seven cosmic planes. And each of these have seven subplanes, but for our purposes, I've only identified the seven subplanes of the cosmic physical plane. Okay, that's our solar system. All right, and for us, the ones that we're all primarily working on are the bottom three of those the mental, emotional, and physical. And here it is again the constitution of man. This one has a lot more detail in it. Uh, this is actually uh, TCF chart 8, uh, for those of you who want to go look at it. It's got a little bit of color to it. Um, but this is how our universe relates to who we are, okay? And as we can see that each of these, these are already subplanes of the cosmic physical, but they're divided by seven again. With our consciousness, the higher we are consciously aware of, the closer to spirit we become. We being down here on the physical etheric, spirit up there at the top on the divine. Oh. 
Okay, I'm not so sure I'm coordinated enough to do that, but <laughs> thank you. Um, okay. So uh, the same principle follows with the etheric planes. The higher they go, the more rarefied that matter is, the, uh, the ether uh, that they're made of. So substance of that first cosmic ether, which I would point to if I were smart enough, but up there at the top, the first cosmic ether um, is going to be uh, more capable of creating and sustaining a universe than, say, me because it's much more rarefied matter. Uh, and as we can see here, the personality is made up of the lower 18 subplanes. See, you can kind of identify it there on the right. And those 18 subplanes are seven from the physical etheric, seven from the astral, four from the lower mental. Then the spiritual triad is identified on here too. Um, with the mental, buddhic, and atmic permanent atoms. So we actually reach the lowest point of the spiritual triad when he, we have reached the highest subplane of the mental plane, as uh, I think Michael was showing us that earlier. Yes, thank you. Okay. This has so much detail in it, um, and I've, comp I've added some more detail to it as well. Um, okay, Light of the Soul, this comes from page 334 of Light of the Soul. It actually gives us some really good information that I, I like to think of when I, when I look in relations of this. Okay, so the divine planes are the top three. Plane one, the logoic, it's divine will. Plane two, the monadic, love, wisdom. Plane three, the spiritual or atmic, which relates to active intelligence. And then as Eva was telling us, we've got the buddhic plane, which is the plane of harmony, plane four. It's the plane of union or at one And then we have the three planes of human endeavor, the ones most of us are used to. Uh, the physical etheric at the bottom, the emotional and the mental plane, representing the correspondences to the ones we saw at the top. Human will, human emotion, and human activity. The most rarefied of the ethers is considered, um, oops, I think I had much of that, the two of fire, or God, the father aspect of the first or the lower plane. The next version of the Akosha, a Sanskrit word that means to shine or radiate. Can you see if I'm smart enough to go? There. See, it's over on the, there you go, thank you. Um, so it means to shine or radiate, and it relates to God, the sun aspect of the second or monadic plane. And the next plane downward is the atmic. It is, uh, the substance is just ether. It's a little rarefied, but still very similar to the acacia. And it's considered God, the Holy Ghost. So we have all these little relationships that are going on uh, in there. The plane of union or at one uh, represents union and harmony. Uh, it's air, an element that's associated with relationships. The planes of the human endeavor, uh, mental is fire, which is a reflection of the sea of fire. Uh, emotional is a reflection of the acacia, it's the astral light. And the physical uh, is the lower ether's uh, reflection of the ether. And as we can see, um, the bottom, the physical plane, the uh, etheric physical, represents the same things that we see. The first ether represents the first cosmic ether. The second ether of the physical plane represents the second cosmic ether. See, there's relationships going on all around with these. And consciousness does manifest on all of these planes. And one way that we can see that is working through our senses. I just love the relationships that uh, DK identifies for us with the senses. Um, fire, the breath, acacia, the sound or hearing. Ether is that vibratory response, touch, air, vision, and sight. Fire, discrimination, taste, the astralite, desire, and smell. Uh, the physical is uh, the organs, all of the organs. So let's face it, without our vehicles or organs, we can't really relate to the world around us, can we? 
The physical plane is the plane of active experience in and through matter. The five higher subplanes of the physical plane are made of five grades of physical substance that have certain vibratory qualities that relate to our senses, as we've seen here. So here we go again, just this portion of the constitution of man. And like everything else, the higher we go in consciousness, the function shifts to a higher correspondence. Okay, hearing on the physical plane, it's, it's his own note, his brother's note, the note of the group. It becomes clairaudience, those more subtle messages. We learn to listen on a deeper level, registering their inner feelings. And then higher clairaudience is the mental response. Uh, it's a specific understanding of details, patterns, and shapes. It begins to form an understanding of how the sound was created and how it can be used. Touch enables us to establish value in relation to others. On the physical plane, this touch reveals size and texture. On the astral plane, touch registers the inherent quality of things or people that we contact. This is known as psychometry, the ability to discover facts about a thing or a person by touching them. On the mental plane, touch registers as planetary psychometry, the ability to sense the quality and condition of the whole planet and the various groups which exist within it. Sight on the physical plane gives a sense of proportion and enables us to adjust our movements to those of the others. Sight manifests as clairvoyance on the astral through the use of the solar plexus, allowing the first vision of inner worlds. Later, as a disciple, we learn to use higher clairvoyance, a function of the mind on the mental plane. It reveals truth through thought forms, usually symbols, which bring light, information, and inspiration. Taste is basic, uh, making choices, acceptance, or rejection. On the physical plane, taste helps us decide what we want to eat or to nourish our bodies. On the astral plane, taste is experienced as imagination, leading us to search for new, exciting flavors. On the mental plane, taste replaces emotion and discrimination is developed to destroy illusion. Taste helps to decide what we take into our thoughts, what we think, how we judge what is good or bad for us. This discrimination ultimately allows us to distinguish between the self and the not self, between right and wrong. Smell was the last sense to be developed on the physical plane, and it stimulates a desire to move closer to a scent that attracts us or to withdraw from a disagreeable smell. As we experienced our consciousness on the astral plane, smell becomes a sense of emotional idealism based on intuitive reaction. On the mental plane, this brings spiritual discernment, which allows us to respond to a group vibration. As a Treatise on White Magic tells us, one of the most vital things every aspirant has to do is to learn to understand the astral plane, to comprehend its nature, and to learn both to stand free from it and then work on it. Then we begin to relate more and more to the mental plane, where we develop the right use of the intellect with the lower mind, abstract thinking, with the higher mind. We have three basic stages of developing the mind. First, where the mind is the receiver of impressions from the outer world via the five senses and the brain. This sensory reception provides the individual with knowledge to evaluate his place in the outer world. Next is a stage where the mind initiates its own activities. The intellect becomes a dominating factor. The reasoning mind acts upon the information gained and forms its own stream of thoughts to add to the perception it has gathered. And then the third stage where the soul, through concentration and meditation, succeeds in imposing ideas and impression upon the mind held steady in the light, enabling the mental body to respond to soul impressions. This plane is associated with modern humanity, where developing the mental body is in, and its subplanes is the current evolutionary goal. 
A correlation would be to consider this the adult stage of human consciousness. So, we just begin to wrap our minds around all of these divisions. Oh yeah, that makes sense to me, right? Uh, but, let me read this great quote from Esoteric uh, Psychology too. The value of the above information consists in the fact that it gives, symbolically, a synthetic picture of man's unfoldment upon higher relations. Its danger consists in the capacity of the human intellect to separate and divide so that the process is regarded as proceeding in successive stages, whereas in reality there is often a paralleling activity going on, much overlapping, fusing, and interrelating of aspects of rays and of processes within the time cycle. So just when we get comfortable, he says, oh, I didn't really mean that. <laughs> Esoteric psychology also tells us from the angle of the initiates of the age ageless wisdom, the story of man, the aspirant, is a story of his response to or repulse of applied energies. The fact that the interplay between different types of energy result in the formation of those aggregations or condensations of force which we call bodies or vehicles, material or immaterial, is incidental to the main issue, which is the development of a conscious response to the life of God. Small units of energy, relatively speaking, are swept into contract, contact with great fields of force, which we call planes. According to the extent of the impact, so will be the response between the unit of energy and the field contacted, and so will be the quality and vibratory activity of the atoms of matter which are attracted and held together. They will best constitute a temporary form from which can be seen as externalized and as relatively tangible and which can function as a mode or medium whereby the soul can contact larger forms of divine life and expression. The more intricate the organism of the form and the more complex and perfect the response apparatus, the more clearly will be indicated the age of the soul and the perfected intent or potency of its will the freer it will be from the limiting karma of an unevolved conditioning vehicle. So the dense physical body responds to impulse from the outer environment as well as the inner soul impulses. The etheric body, it's separate and it's a much more a subtle vehicle. It contains the chakras, the nervous system that vitalize this physical counterpart. The vital or etheric body, DK tells us, is the major energizing factor and is an exact replica or counterpart of the outer form, being the true intermediary, intermediary between the inner worlds and the outer man. The nadis, those lines or threads of force, underlie every nerve in the human body and the centers which they form at certain points of intersection are the background or motivating agency of every ganglion or plexus found in the human body. The inner energies make contact through the seven centers of our etheric body as described here. The pineal gland relates to the head center, pituitary to the ajna, the throat, uh, the thyroids uh, to the throat, the thymus to the heart, the pancreas to the solar plexus, the adrenals to the base of the spine, gonads to the sacrum. DK tells us these centers are closely concerned with the endocrine system, which we see here, which they determine and condition according to the quality and source of the energy which flows through them. Then he tells us he's not going to get into it now in this particular passage uh, in esoteric psychology, but he does specifically want to draw our attention uh, to the relation between the centers of force in the etheric body, the processes of integration which bring one center after another into activity, and the eventual control of the soul after the final atonement of the entire personality. Okay. 
This is an absolutely great poster of the Constitution of Man. And the bookstore has a couple of them, and it can also be found online if you guys want it. Uh, I highly recommend it to everybody. Yes, thank you so much for the lady who created it. <laughs> um, okay, so this is actually a colored version with, I think, a couple of extra things added to it from uh, Trees on Cosmic Fire, page 817. Um, Okay, DK tells us in Esoteric Astrology that within the human etheric body, there are to be found seven major force centers which are in, in, our, are in the nature of distributing agencies and electrical batter, batteries. They're providing a dynamic force and qualitative energy to the man. They produce definite effects upon his outer physical manifestation. Through their constant activity, his quality appears, his ray tendencies be begin to emerge, and its point in evolution is clearly indicated. What we see here is that the four lower chakras are located on the lowest subplane of the etheric, the touch feeling purplish pink um, right there. One more up for the heart center, one more up for the throat center, then one more up for the heart center, and then the head center is located on the highest of the seven subplanes. And we see that pattern repeated on the uh, etheric, the astral, and the mental plane. Okay, um, chakra is defined, it just literally uh, translates as wheel or disc. It's a wheel of energy. Uh, there are four centers formed where the lines of energy in the etheric web cross, or in our body cross. Let's see the three basic. Um, okay, so they vitalize the physical body. They develop self-consciousness for us. This may be relatively undeveloped state of consciousness of the savage, uh, the consciousness of the average man, or the highly developed consciousness of the initiate up to the third degree. Whatever the case, it's always concerned with consciousness. Only the point at the center is concerned with the first aspect, the life aspect. The petals of the chakras are concerned with the second aspect, consciousness. The state of the consciousness is indicated by the size, the color, the activity of the energies which compose the petals. Their unfoldment and development is conditioned by their governing rays, as well as by the age and the length of the soul's expression. Eventually, the centers transmit spiritual energy. The point at the center of the uh, Goic lotus, the jewel in the lotus, is the point used by the monad to anchor itself upon the physical plane. It contains within itself all possibilities, all potentialities, all experiences, and vibratory activities. It eventually leads to the return of the so-called eternal pilgrim to the Father's home. After many eons of experience. <coughs> Energies flow from the physical world, feeding and controlling the animal appetites. From the astral world, determining the desires, emotions, and aspirations. From the lower mental, developing self-will, selfishness, separateness, and the direction of life upon the physical plane. Energies also flow from the soul. We hear about the transferring of the energies from the center below the diaphragm to those above it. So I'd just like to give you an understanding of that phrase. Simply put, the diaphragm is a dome-shaped muscle that separates the thoracic cavity, the lungs and heart region, from the various organs that are found in the abdominal cavity, stomach, liver, spleen, pancreas, adrenals, etc. Okay. So the soul is focused in the higher centers, the crown spiritual consciousness, the Ajna mental consciousness, the throat creative consciousness, and the heart feeling consciousness. The personality is expressed through the three lower centers. The sacral, which is the mental element that transfers eventually to the throat. The solar plexus, the astral element that transfers eventually to the heart. The base of the spine, the physical element that eventually transfers to the head center. Um, there are different correspondences with the chakras, 
And so I just want to show you a couple of them. Here's a quick look at the relationship between the chakra signs, the exoteric rulers as used by traditional astrology. <laughs> Here they are in relationship to the seven rays, and this particular one is the rays of aspect. This information is compiled from Esoteric Psychology, Volumes 1 and 2, and Esoteric Healing. But I want you to be aware that DK also gives other correspondences in relation to some other things. Um, so it's not just one size fits all. And here's the rays of attribute. Transmitting the lower chakras to the ones above the diaphragm is something we all eventually begin to do. This is a fairly ordered process that naturally proceeds as the person steps on the path and begins to take himself in hand, purifying the lower vehicles, building the antikarana, and working selflessly to aid his soul group trying to artificially raise the chakras when the body is not prepared can cause serious problems. Esoteric Psychology 2 has an ext extensive section on problems resulting from the premature awakening or the overstimulation of the centers. So if you want to pursue that avenue, I highly recommend reading that. Okay, let's look a little closer at these chakras. The base center has four petals, we're told in uh, esoteric psychology. Individuals focused in the base center are intent upon survival in nature, as this center is related to the physical plane and gives grounding. It is awakened in its true and final sense at the third initiation by an act of will directed from the head. The sacral center has six petals. Still predominantly animal in nature, these individuals are possessed by sexual desire. At the first initiation, sacral energies begin to be raised to the throat center, and eventually the creative output of the aspirant will work primarily through the higher point. The solar plexus has 10 petals. Ordinary uh, humanity are focused here in the solar plexus, and the average person, it works closely with the sacral and base centers with desires focused on the lower appetites. In more advanced man, it gives desire for recognition and for better quality of life. In the person approaching the second initiation, it acts as a clearing ground for the energies of the lower centers, which begin to be gathered up by the solar plexus and then transferred up to the heart center. The throat center has 16 petals. All advanced humanity are focused in this center. Purification of the physical appetites results in the transfer upwards of energy from the sacral to the throat. And individuals focused in the higher center become mentally creative. This center provides the entry point for energy from the mental plane. The throat center of the spiritual aspirant, disciples, and initiates below the third initiation is responding primarily to the seventh ray influence. The heart center has 12 petals. This center becomes active after the first initiation, which relates man to the buddhic plane of intuition and the second divine aspect of love wisdom. The heart center is the center of universal love. The solar plexus is the seat of personal human love. As we evolve and the heart center begins to awaken under soul impulse, it draws up the energies of the solar plexus, thereby controlling the desire nature. This is a slow process, and it doesn't fully open until the fourth initiation. The Ajna center gives the appearance of having two petals, more like two lobes. Uh, it's got 96 petals, actually. Aspirants and disciples are becoming focused in this center. It's dominant after the second initiation, and it's fully functional by the third initiation. It is the seed of personality power and represents the highest form of creative intelligence in man. It is also the organ of imagination. The crown center is said to have 960 petals. Occultists, initiates, and masters are focused in this center. 
It is dominant after the third initiation and relates man to the atmic plane and the first aspect, will and power. It provides the soul its point of entry and exit in the body. So as we, okay, Michael, you gave it to me. And the heart in the head. <laughs> so we just saw first the centers below the below the diaphragm are controlling and dominant. This is a stage of dense materiality, lower desire, and physical urge in full expression. It was representative of Lemurian times. And at that time, the sacral center controlled. Then after a long period of time, eventually other centers below the diaphragm become fully active with the major emphasis, emphasis shifting to the solar plexus, which eventually becomes the great clearing house for all the lower forces and marks the period where it's possible to begin the shift into the higher body, the astral body. This was characteristic of Atlantean development. The next crisis is the awakening of the throat center and shift of the lower energy into higher activity. The Ajna also begins to become active, producing integrated and creative personalities. This is characteristic of the present Orion development, the fifth root race. So while we know many people today with quite negative personalities, a couple of them we see every day in the news, the fact that they uh, even have an integrated and, and powerful personality tells us what stage that they're working at, doesn't it? And the nature and scope of their work tell us how much further in this particular stage they have yet to go. The awakening of the heart center is the shift of the solar plexus energy to the heart produces group activity. This is awakening in disciples today, but not yet in humanity as a whole. And it marks the beginning of a new sense of spiritual energy for the disciple. It will progress more for humanity as a whole in the next great race to come, the sixth root race. And finally, many thousands of years in the future, humanity as a whole will experience the crisis that awakens the head center with the consequent arousing of kundalini fire at the base of the spine that leads to the final integration of soul and body and the appearance of a perfected humanity upon earth. This will express the nature of the final seventh root race. First transference, sacral to throat, first initiation. Aspirants transfer force from the sacral to the throat, increasing activity of some kind that is creative in other ways besides just pursuit of sex or money. The centers below the diaphragm are fully awakened, active, and vivid. It creates a magnetic field moving the whole area, making it potent enough to extend its influence above the diaphragm. The solar plexus dominates, receiving the absorbing energy from the sacral and deflecting it upwards as the sacral forces are carried to the throat and solar plexus forces are carried to the heart. Although transference to the heart is almost negligible at this point at the first initiation. The person is now highly intelligent, conscious of the dualism of his nature and ready to tread the path of probation. Discipleship becomes his keynote and he works on purifying his lower appetites, a long and difficult period. The aspirant becomes a mystic as the heart and throat centers become increasingly more active. He is intelligently creative and slowly becoming group conscious. However, his reactions are still selfishly motivated, yet he has visions and periods of spiritual efforts and the mystical life is gaining momentum. Pluto and Vulcan rule the first initiation. Uh, the influence of Vulcan reaches to the very depths of his nature while Pluto drags to the surface and destroys all that hinders in the lower region. 
Maybe that's how Pluto got his bad rap. Second initiation, the dominant personality is in control of the lower forces until the disciple learns to respond to the higher energies and transfers the forces that have been raised to the heart and throat into the ashna, marking an integration of the personality. The integrated personality can still be materialistic as personality ambitions dominate at first, but that's a temporary expression of a coordinated personality. This is an intelligent, creative, powerful person who's learning to use all of his new faculties. Then the soul begins to stimulate the ajna. The ajna is vivid and potent. The throat is intensively active, and the heart center is rapidly awakening to its full potential. The second initiation is learning to control the astral desire nature. Neptune, Venus, and Jupiter all play their part. Jupiter develops the heart center and more inclusive attitudes. Venus governs uh, the ashna and develops the ability to love intelligently. When Neptune is active in the advanced person, then emotion desire has been transmuted into love aspiration and is dedicated to and oriented towards the soul. Then the entire emotional or sensitive nature is responsive to energies coming from the heart of the sun. And when this is the case, it indicates that the disciple is now ready for the second initiation. In preparation for the third initiation, focus shifts to the control of the mind and then the entire personality. The period between the second and third initiation is said to be one of intense suffering, which is the residual penalty of glamour and illusion. We're told that light pours in only occasionally from the soul during this time. The third initiation, a period of soul control where the crown becomes radiantly active because of the uprising in a fresh and more potent manner of the mystical instinct combined with an intelligent approach that results in soul pouring energy into the etheric centers via the crown, the point at the heart of each center becoming so brilliant that it dims the light of all that lies around, and all the centers are then swept into ordered activity by the forces of love and will. Then the final transference occurs, where all the bodily and psychic energies from the base of the spine transfer into the crown. As DK tells us in Esoteric Astrology, uh, Volume 2, I'm sorry, Psychology, Volume 2, the great polar opposites is symbolized and expressed by the head center, the organ of spiritual energy, and the center at the base of the spine, the organ of the material forces, are fused and blended. And from this time on, the man is controlled only from above by the soul. I've got a couple of quotes here to finish this off. Man is therefore, from the angle of force expression, a mass of conflicting energies and an active center of moving forces with a shift of emphasis constantly going on. And with the aggregation of the numerous streams of energy presenting a confusing kaleidoscope of active interrelations, interpenetrations, and interdependence uh, until such time as the personality forces symbolic of divine multiplicity are subdued or brought into line by the now dominant soul. He tells us uh, that is what we really mean by the word alignment. Alignment results in the control of the personality by the soul, the downpouring of soul energy via the mental and emotional bodies into the brain, thus producing the subjugation of the lower nature, awakening the brain consciousness to its soul awareness. The right arrangement according to ray type of these energies which are motivating and dynamically arousing these centers into activity. So it's going to be different for all of us depending on our ray structure. This leads eventually to a direct alignment of the centers upon the spine so that soul energy can pass up and down through the centers from the directing center in the head. Whilst this process of soul control is being perfected, and the time consumed is of vast duration, 
the ray types of the vehicles steadily emerged. The ray of the personality begins to control the life, and finally, the soul ray begins to dominate the personality ray and subdue its activities. And just one more for you here. The science of the centers is yet in its infancy, as is the science of the rays and the science of astrology. But much is being learned and developed along these three lines. And when the present barriers are down and true scientific investigation is instituted along these lines, a new era will begin for the human being. These three sciences will constitute the three major departments of the science of psychology in the new age, plus the contributions of modern psychology and the insight into the nature of man, particularly the physical nature, which has so wonderfully developed. That's all I got for you. I crammed a whole bunch into a little. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, it's so it's so important. Um, yeah, give me a, to have these um, fundamentals under our belt. If we're going to use astrology, you know, like the average astrologer uses it, they don't know this stuff. And they naturally apply their astrology to their own worldview. And this is these are the occult energy fundamentals of the whole structure of man, of the planet, of the cosmos. And naturally, astrology w will be used differently accordingly. So, you know, a lot of good fifth-ray information here that we actually need. As esoteric astrologers, it will change the entire way we interpret the chart and what we can do for our clients. So uh, we've had um, <clears throat> we've had quite a quite a picture of the occult world in which we work in these first two lectures. And now, after your break, uh, which is uh, coming up, we're going to get into the uh, actual application of the astrology to the living people like you and me who are disciples on the path and who are facing one or other of the first three initiations. And Eleanor will present that, so do get a little break while you can. Fifteen minutes, and that's it. Okay.